Now, Harry said it basically becomes the hunter versus the prey, which I thought was really important because a lot of their adversaries will say, oh, they're out there. If you are a international relations double major from Northwestern, it is hard for me to believe you didn't know that you had to curtsy in front of the queen. Welcome to Come Back with Erica Cobb. I am here for a very special comeback. This is going to be episode two of the Harry and Meghan on Netflix special. Now, of course, last week I introduced you to my co-host from Daily Blast Live and friend, Tori Shulman. Hello, everyone. Hello. She is back, um, but we've changed it up a little bit. In the interest of transparency, um, we have has been struggling for some studio time. Y'all know... <laughs> We have been getting so many tweets and so many. messages on social media asking when part two is going to drop. So let me be very clear. We are doing part two and part three today. Mm -hmm. Today is Wednesday. We are going to come back and record part four through six on Friday. So by the end of the weekend, you will have the entire installment of the Harry and Meghan on Netflix series. So today, if it sounds a little different, we are recording from my home. Look at this place. We're, we're hanging place. out here. So if you're listening, go to our social media um, so you can see our little setup because we're in front of the fireplace. Don't know how long we can keep this on. It's hot. Um, but we're going to have a little fireplace chat we while are. we can. We are. A fireside okay. chat. That's exactly what it is. All right. So let's get this started yes. because episode uh, two starts with November 2021, the car security mm. detail. Now, you you kind of alluded to this in the past episode about Harry and the way that he acted in the car. Yes. I found this to be my f most interesting part of the entire three parts. Mm. Um, only because I've always wanted to see what it would be like for Harry to be in a car. And then if you don't, you saw there was that paparazzi maybe following him. Right. And so, <clears throat> sorry, we have someone on our show, Daily Blast Live, that does body language. But he was panicked. Yeah. I mean, he was... It's there. It's there. Where is it? And I just imagined him thinking about his mom and what to do. And what I thought was such an interesting foil was Megan's body language. Mm. She grabbed the hand. She was very sort of like, who? it's been a day. And then she said, um, well, we can go from garage to garage. And then she said, or he said, we'll be with friends in 10 minutes. We'll be with friends in yeah. 10 minutes. And I thought, God, I... That was more intimate than a lot of other scenes, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, it kind of reiterated to me that Megan is his calm. Exactly. And that they play off each other and that when he was in a heightened state, yeah. she calmed down. Totally. And I, based on some of the things that we know, of, the little that we know about their story, that when she was in a state of emotional distress, that he, he was calm. her calm. Right. And I mean, when you're talking about relationships, there's really not anything more you can ask for in terms of balancing that. Now, Harry said it basically becomes the hunter versus the prey, which I thought was really important because a lot of their adversaries will say, oh, they're out there, they're on red carpets, they're doing all of these things in order to garner attention. Right. And the attention is clearly there whether they want it or not. Yeah, it's inc inc I mean, there's, it, you can't look at that footage and not think that's invasive. Right. It's every day. It's all the time. And if you've seen the Diana ones, it's going to the gym and she's like trying to get to her car. I mean, there's no like even personal space between mm. it. So um, that that intensity is not something we see with the American media. And as Americans, we need to be clear that that's different. There are different rules. See, I'm going to push back on that a little bit because the intensity that's there in with the British media has always been there with the American media. It's just that there were, it involved more people mm. and they got together and created some very clear boundaries. Exactly. We talk about Kristen Bell and Dax Shepard and how she really championed for paparazzi not to be able to legally take unauthorized photos of the their children. children. Yeah. So when you have like two different sides of the equation, then you see how just 
a few people coming together and not coming from a source that needs to utilize the media in the same ways as the British monarchy do. I understand that a lot of people have said in Hollywood, you know, they use the paparazzi, they call them, but not everyone does. Right. So when a bunch of, you know, Hollywood elite got together and said, this is unsafe, and that happened right after the death of Princess Diana. It was really at because of Diana. Yeah. I mean, we talk about personal space and the idea of like, back up, back up, back up. I think just paparazzi in general, which if you don't know, is Itali Italian for mosquitoes. Mm. And it's because they get, they're buzzing everywhere all yeah. over you. And the, what's weird to me is that after that, it just fundamentally changed after Diana. Yeah. Because the stakes, the highest stakes of all happened, occurred, right. we saw it, and you couldn't blame anyone but the media. And exactly. And possibly somewhat her driver. Um, but um, yeah, it changed. I just don't know if it changed for Harry. I just always felt like that pressure never went away until yeah. he got here. Well, we're going to get to that because we go from this opening scene of seeing how they're reacting in the car yeah. to the different pop and they're spotting them. Yeah, one was like, in the garage, one was in the basement, bike, one is bicycling, what, right? you know, all of that. And then we completely shift to Mama Doria. Uh, Megan's mother. What was her first thing she said? Did you hear that? Uh, the last five years have been challenging. I'm ready to have my voice heard. Mm. That's for sure. I mean, that says it all. That should be the tagline of the entire documentary. My voice, like my mm. literal voice, not what you think. Right. Yeah. So first of all, Mama Doria is stunning. I gotta take a drink. She's so beautiful. And graceful. And like a ballerina. Oh my gosh. Did you see her move her whole body when she moved? Like she has abs. I don't have. Well, you know she's what I mean? a yoga instructor. Incredibly uh, athletic and physical. Yeah, because very she's strong. Very poised. Yes. I think she has been an unsung hero for the past, you know, since the, the beginning when yeah. they first started dating yeah. because she has been a symbol of unwavering strength but she has never really spoken. Ever. Silent. Yeah. And I thought what's so interesting is she is to Megan what I think Megan is to Harry. Mm. Like, she's the calm yeah. for Megan. And you could see she physically calms when she's with her mom. I love that relationship. Yeah. I also loved how um, her mother delved into when she first learned that Harry and Meghan were dating and how big of a secret that was. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was such a relatable moment. Like, I remember telling my mother, you know, when I first started dating my husband, Anthony, and I told her first because I, one, was thinking about all of the other factors. Mm. Like I was just divorced and, you know, I knew that some people in my circle at that time had some serious questions that they were, you know, they were questioning me about my moves, which at that point in my life, um, just to be transparent, I was like, you weren't questioning when I was miserable, but you're questioning yes. <laughs> when I'm isn't it? happy. That's right. Um, that's which right. is, you know, I mean, that's Weird a red timing, flag. Right? Yeah, right. right, it's a red flag. But she said that it was such a secret and she kept that secret. Yeah. Uh, and, in, and in comparison to the father, which mm. we will, of course, go into, the two could not be more opposite at all yeah. um, of what, she, uh, let me just say this, the philosophy of parenting, yeah. of what she believes it is and what he believes it is. Very was. different. Very different, and she made that very clear and was shocked by his behavior. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, because it's so out of her nature. It's like when, when someone does something that you can empathize with because it's the same move you would have made, Sh sure. that doesn't produce shock. Right. But when it's the antithesis of anything you would have even dreamt of doing, right. then I can understand that being a very guttural reaction. Absolutely. So we get to this, and I, I love the way that Mama Doria talked about Mama the Doria. first time she met Harry. Like, it just, it felt like she talked about his stature and she talked about how polite he was. Mm -hmm. But at the, the undertone of the way she spoke about him was, it was almost like she was saying everything I would want for my daughter. Yeah, it almost for me felt as if it wasn't Prince Harry, yeah. but someone that you're like, you're what, your mom is like, now that man's good enough for my daughter. Yeah. It, it had nothing to do with him, royal, at all. It was no. the grace and the characteristics of because because she raised a hell of a woman, mm -hmm. so the expectations of who that person mates mm -hmm. with and becomes, you know, lives the rest of their life with is pretty high. Yeah. And uh, she was taken by him, I think. Very much so. And she talked about how it was great, 
you know, until it wasn't. And I thought this part of it was so interesting because you hear from these news outlets that are so glowing. We hear things like the the title is actress Meghan Markle has apparently won the heart of bad boy Prince Harry. Mm -hmm. That was from The Real um, daytime talk show. Brainy beauty, uh, brainy beauty who captured Prince Harry's heart. Um, Wendy Williams said this young lady is very philanthropic, works for the UN. She does a lot of charity work, which is probably their original connection. That's what we're hearing from the U.S. media. And may I also add that those were the voices of other black women. I was just going to say, what do they have in common? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it was very clear from the jump that that's what it was. Mm -hmm. It wasn't any. And then it got all twisted. It's yeah. like if it had just been that way, the fairy tale could have continued. Right. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, we still don't have anything other than maybe she eats too many avocados and she wore a brown hat. Like, the hat, I mean, man. weird things <laughs> to really come for. It's like of all things to come for somebody totally. like, Lord have mercy, heaven forbid, not avocados. Not the fruit of the avocados <laughs> good <laughs> job like, sorry. i mean but for real it's like minor minor things and that's why it like spiraling got so out of control yeah yeah well speaking of the spiral we'll get into that first you're listening to come back with erica cobb we are covering episode two of harry and megan Ooh. on netflix okay. um so we go from this fairy tale U.S. media right. is celebrating like, this. Woo! Yes, Megan, they, they Sparkle Markle. The best thing ever, right? And British people were also celebrating as well because we have to acknowledge that there are two sides of the coin. And when we're having this conversation, we're not disparaging people from Britain. No. We're not disparaging people from the U.K. We're focusing on the tactics and held by the British media. And I think it's very important that we have that conversation because a lot of people do feel represented by that union. But let's get to where it turned and spiraled because there was a point early on when people knew that they were dating that Megan is walking out of the flower shop mm -hmm. and there are she, nine to 10 paparazzi this and is she acknowledges them. She smiles, God mm. forbid. She does the American old or just not even a wave, just a smile, just yeah. say hi. And it was absolutely read very differently in Britain, isn't mm -hmm. it? It's, the smile was, you want it. Right. You are asking for this. Which I- I had never thought of. Yes, I wouldn't have thought I of it either. I never thought of this. I wouldn't have, th I would have thought, if someone's speaking to me, then if I don't speak back, it's, especially on camera, it's very rude. It's incredibly rude. And isn't that the opposite? Mm -hmm. The stiff upper lip, you don't smile. It just is, one is a British way and one is an American way. And man, when he said it though, as soon as yeah. he said, it looks like you called the paparazzi or wanted them there, yeah. I immediately understood what he was saying. Right, because he's always been told, he isn't Harry, has always been told, you know, not to acknowledge Ever. them, not to speak to them, don't look their way. And like, Megan's coming from a totally different culture, but it's interesting when you said it looked like, they said it looked like she wanted it. And I said, that feels very rape culture. I was just gonna say that. Where else do you hear that? Like, where else do you hear that yeah. phrase? And I'm sorry, but immediately for almost every woman, that's gonna come up. Yeah. It looked like she wanted it. That's the first thing I thought yeah. was, what a, what a rape culture phrase. Absolutely. Of what you, you were wearing it. Right. Look, I totally agree. You were in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's victim blaming. Totally. And this was her space. Up until that moment, she could walk freely out of the flower shop, which I'm sure she probably did a lot. Like once a week. She got peonies. Yes. You know what I mean? She got peonies. And peonies don't last They're that long, y'all. I mean, like, we're talking five days tops. They're so. just the petals. They it, go, they wilt. Exactly. And they are a beautiful flower, but you're going to have to go back and forth to that flower shop quite a bunch and of it's times. Like she's Belle, you know, I bet that was a really nice private walk that she had with yeah. herself. And that smile and that flash shifted everything. Yeah. Shifted. And I think her reality shifted of like oh wait I can't even smile yeah yeah that would have been enough and I wrote down that would have been enough for me to be like I'm hey out. dude I really like you but I gotta go but like this isn't worth it <laughs> <laughs> like I can't I even go to get flowers peonies in peace I want my peonies in peace yeah like, I hear you dude because that changes that means everything's changed exactly if you can't smile at that if this is true then that is true right that's a transitive property that's gonna blow your mind exactly and the next thing that we learn about is her house in Toronto being surrounded 
by paparazzi. Her neighbors, some of them were supporting her, texting and telling her, hey, people are knocking on doors looking for you. They're asking questions. Others opted to put actual cameras on their homes in order to see into her house. Yeah. Capitalism. I mean, on their garages. Wow. Right overlooking it. And that's just, look, your mind either goes one or two ways when you're next to someone being hounded. You mm. either want profit from it or you want to look out, protect them. Profit yeah. or protect. Which one are you? Huh? What, yeah. That's a great question. Profit or protect? That is a great question. Would you sell someone up the river in order for profit, especially, I mean, she's at this point, up until now, she's been a single woman. Yeah. She has a home in Toronto. Yeah. First of all, She's a single woman with a home in Toronto, okay? She doesn't come from a tremendous amount yeah, of wealth. A, that's a great... It's a I huge think, accomplishment. Uh, huge, huge. Wait, she was, by, by herself, she was an amazing... She was doing extremely well. Yes. Yes. Traveling, living her best life, and now there are men... You know. ...outside of her home trying to get into the property, trying to, you know, completely encroach on her space. Violate that privacy. And yeah. I, I just thought, like... You know how protective I am of my home. Yes, for like, good reason. I yes, it, it is. It is a very when your space has been violated. Yes. I can speak to this. Um, when someone has tried to come into your home, come into your space for nefarious purposes, it puts you on high alert and it gives you a level of PTSD. Yes, this happened to me, and ever since then, if someone is parked in front of my home for too long, I am on security cameras, I'm looking, I'm checking out, I'm making notes of, you know, making sure you can see the driver's license, just in case. Because once you've experienced something like that, it's hard for you not to- It's your new reality. Right, yeah. think about You're it. You're hypervigilant. Exactly. Same thing with like, it's, it, and then, and then it's, just so you guys know, hypervigilance, and a lot of people are, like with my mom's medical issue, I can tell when someone's upset from across the room without looking, because mm. you can just feel it. It's exhausting. It's mm. just, it takes a lot out of you. So she was surrounded. Right. Fully surrounded. Hunted is a good word. It, very much so. Yeah. And, you know, I talked about Megan's story. Um, which is they really get into it at this point because it goes from like the paparazzi surrounding the house in Toronto to getting into like who Megan really is and where she's from. And I thought it was quite fascinating with the story of, you know, with her mother and uh, Doria and her because obviously Megan is biracial, Doria is a black woman, a melanated queen, yes. honey, okay? And she <laughs> talked about people, you know, growing up, people thinking that her mother was a nanny. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, what that does to someone in terms of, you know, being able to maneuver life. And I thought it was interesting from her perspective because I am in an interracial marriage and, you know, we are trying to have children and I anticipate on some level that this is something that I am going to be forced to deal with the same way that my husband Fair. is going to be, you know, forced to maneuver and deal with and learn from. Um, you know, many times I've been asked if I was the dog walker, so I get... <laughs> That's gotta that feel type great. Of thing. That's gotta feel good. Like what? <laughs> like, just, oh, wow. I mean, in that, when we lived in high rises, Shit. like, people be like, oh, so I know that this is Spike, so you're the dog walker. Wow. Like, what? Wow, spike to the heart right there. Wow. Like, no, this is my dog, okay? <laughs> I know he's white and fluffy and I am a melanated queen, but he can be my dog. <laughs> that can be my husband. Ooh, amen. The That's Italian, hilarious. Icelandic, Canadian guy the, over there. The like, Roman you know, God. This is kind of 2022, y'all. I understand up, people. people have real feelings about it, but guess what? When you're in love and you're living your life, you don't really care what other people think because if you have time to think about it, then that means that you ain't got that for yourself. That's exactly okay? right. Self-validation. That's so, exactly right. Yes, yeah, so I understood that. And then she talked about living in a, you know, going from living with her parents together until two years, two years old, and then her parents split and she lived in a predominantly black community surrounded by relatives. And I thought a few things about that. Um, I... Really, I, I honestly, y'all, I think I just relate to Meghan Markle. Can I be honest? I was thinking about you a lot. I was like, you sort of did the same thing, didn't you? So From one I, to the other. What I, you know, it's it's really crazy. crazy. And we talked about this on the last episode. It's either you relate to someone because they remind you of you, or you relate to someone because they remind you of what, or remind you of what you want to be. Right. Um, or you gravitate towards Your those types board, of people. Yeah. 
And when she talked about living in a predominantly black community and then like the difference just in her life in general, I thought about the transition of space, like the um, juxtaposition of spaces. And Michelle Obama talks about this in her book, Becoming, as mm -hmm. well. Michelle Obama is from the south side of Chicago. She lived in a multi-generational dwelling. I'm from the west side of Chicago. I lived in that same setup of a multi-generational dwelling. They were both predominantly black communities. And when I got to, you know, when I got a little older, we moved to the suburbs and I lived in a predominantly white neighborhood. Mm. And what that showed me at a very young age is that people can live very differently mm. for seemingly no reason at all until you're old enough to understand that there are systems in place mm. and there are hierarchies in place mm. um, that afforded, for instance, my neighbors where none of my, you know, none of my, my friends' mothers worked. And I would see coming from the neighborhood that I came from that the mother worked five jobs. Sure. If, if there was a single family home or a you know two parent family home, both parents were working multiple jobs sure. and they certainly didn't live in the type of homes that I was seeing when I lived in a predominantly white community. Right. So I started being very curious about life and trying to understand why things were so vastly different between where I was on the west side of Chicago and then where I was in the western suburbs. Hmm. It's almost like, and I read a lot of survival books, um, adaptation. Mm. In somewhat, the people like those that have gone through this, where you have to go from extreme to extreme, like a binary existence, right? Mm. Like from a black to white, literally, you have to learn to adapt almost immediately. Yeah. And it's almost a superpower. And I think about Megan, and I think about not only did she go from white to black, she also went from civilian to royalty. Mm. How many times from actress to non-actress, yeah. or you know, for, she is really fluid yeah. in her adaptation, and like a chameleon. And not everyone can do that so gracefully. Yeah. So you and she have that superpower that can be used almost in any situation, really, which is and could be used good for good if they'd allowed her to right. in some ways. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, you know, I'm not trying to, and for those of you who are familiar with my podcast before you ever listen to this with um, Harry and Megan, what I like to do and the way that I operate both on this podcast and on our daytime talk show, Daily Blast Live, if y'all haven't listened or seen it, check it out. Wow, shit. Um, is we are all constantly coming from a place of, this is how I can relate to this situation. Correct. And when you're an ensemble cast, that works really well because the way that Tori relates to a situation is very different than the way that I relate to a situation or anyone else on the panel. And so the hope is at the end of each story, you're getting a little piece of a lot of different experiences. Exactly. In order to paint a, a more to a picture of to totality, but also in order for the viewers or the listening audience to feel like a piece of them was seen as well. Yeah, I think you just have to say there's the danger of a single story. Yeah. I just watched a TED talk on this, the danger of the single story. Like a prism. You mm. just you're gonna get if if you're gonna get one side, one of it will be tainted and one won't. So right. getting uh, a, a vast amount and facets of that. So somehow y'all can relate to something here where they were the prey to a predator and you had to adapt into a situation. Every yeah. human can think of that. Everybody. Yeah. I, so I, I love that we're getting this prism, so to speak, through Megan and Harry, but also through the people who they are truly in a close circle and trust and have a foundation with as well. Because hearing from family and friends and, you know, people who, you know, former colleagues was so important I agree to really with you. paint this story. I didn't know that she was close with her dad. Yeah, that I was surprising. I just didn't know. That I will surprising. be honest with you. I thought they hadn't spoken in like, and when you see video of them early, she was a daddy's girl, yeah. like such a daddy's girl. And he's such a kind dad, he seems, yeah. and gentle in these old videos that I had no idea that separation occurred so recently. Yeah, that I, really shocked me. And it broke my heart. It did too. Be, it Because they were like heart. right up, he ha, she yeah. had the support system until like right at the end. But that's what happens. Yeah, to when the stakes totally get high. Honest, that's yeah. ex when the stakes become high, Ooh. it reveals 
who you truly are. Think about Ugh. you, I mean, you have so many people that come into your life for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. And when people go from reason to season and you firmly believe that they're lifetime people right. because you've been through, you know, so many reasons and seasons, but then it always appears that right before your starship is about to take off, people start to reveal who they truly oh, it's are. awful. And that they might actually be an op operating as a friend or a family member. Yeah, that's good to look out for. They, I mean, I... You've you've seen it. Yeah, oh, I've yeah. seen it. Absolutely. We've experienced Absolutely. those things because what happens is, and this, in my truest belief, is that there comes a certain time in your life where occupancy or the capacity to bring everyone with you is no longer there. The ship is has too few seats. Right. You can't take them right. all. Mm -hmm. And that's I do believe that it's almost like the universe or God or the whatever your super or higher power is is helping you wean these people oh, out. Oh, that's so good. Oh. But when it's your parents. It's your, he's going to walk you down the oh, aisle, Erica. Man. He's going to walk you oh. down. And, and she was trying. I didn't know about the tech. I didn't know she was trying. Yeah. I just, that really blew my mind. Yeah, absolutely. In, in reference to the mom. It really just blew my mind. And we're going to get more into that. You're listening to Come Back with Erica Cobb. We're breaking down episode two of Harry and Meghan on Netflix with my girl Tori Shulman. So we just talked about a little bit about Megan and her relationship with her dad yeah. or now lack thereof. So let's talk about her as a child oh. because, oh, my Lanta, well, who, the, who when, <laughs> when who they got to the little red schoolhouse oh. and the principal who she wrote a message to in the yearbook when she was 11 years old and vowed that when she became rich and famous, she was going to tell the world about this school and how it changed her life. And she did. did. She came back oh. and did it. And you know what's so sad, Erica? At first I was like, oh my God, she manifested that moment yes. so many years ago. Like, it was unbelievable to see that moment. But I saw her kind of be like, oh my gosh, here's what I thought. They're going to use that against her. My first um, thought was the media will say, the British media, and maybe the U.S. media is, she's always wanted to be famous. She's always wanted to be. And I thought, man, I was feeling so good. And then all of a sudden it changed so fast. And I thought, just like the smile of her with the flowers, it just, everything you could use against her, they would. That was such a lovely moment. It was. It was such a it lovely was. moment. Because and then if, I thought, are they going to manipulate even that? Of course. But I think if you take it out of context. Yeah. And that's what this whole Which thing is. Everybody's it's doing. a taking out of context right. game. But what I saw was a young a young girl at that point or, and a woman fulfilling this wish and desire to say, this school, my place of education and the people who fostered that for me are some of the most important people in my life that I am going to make sure that the world knows. knows. Like... I don't care if she wrote it. I don't care if she wrote it across the school I know. front door. Like that is powerful. And then I'm going to let you tell the story, Tori, because you have talked about this campaign that she had rewritten. You talked. It was a du or ivory commercial. Ivory soap. You have been talking about this for the past five years, and she tells the story. She talks about it, and it just tells you a little bit about her activism. She saw a commercial. It was about ivory soap, and it was about women cleaning. And she felt that it was an incredibly, which tells you a lot, by the way, about who she's being raised by and mm. her education, right. to point out and discern this field weird and she wrote a letter like a letter mm -hmm. like a pencil and a lined piece of paper and she sent it away like you do when your mom believes in you send it to the president right yeah and they changed the commercial yeah sorry i got wine on my <laughs> <laughs> but it's like i don't know there are certain people that are changers in this world and it, uh, if you believe in buddhism or whatever you believe in there's a sense of reincarnation whoever she was in her last life she to me has a older soul yeah. Yeah. an older soul mm -hmm. that can understand that can can focus that can adapt i'm not in love with her but i'm close <laughs> <laughs> i'm close i you know i, it, I found First of all, I was for, like that nerdy and yes, political. Yes. And I think it's also important to like think about at that age, 11 years old, like Dude. that's when we were writing 
letters to companies. Totally. You know, like anyone who's around, you know, our age, about 40 years old, somewhere in that in that bubble. Um, I remember writing the Welch's grape juice. Of course. I told them how much I love their grape juice every Sunday it's at a, communion. It's a great grape juice. Did yeah, you? I did. I did. At communion. I did. I loved it. And I wish, and I told them that I, I really wish that I could drink more, but they you? only gave us a thimble. So they sent me a coupon for like a dozen Welch's grape juice. I drank Welch's grape juice the entire summer. <laughs> So I was like, this is great. Yes. That is hilarious. Yes, but I wasn't being an activist. I was just being greedy. You just wanted Welch's <laughs> grape juice. She's all, I'm thirsty. <laughs> I love that grape juice. It is delicious. Yes. It is delicious. So I was like, oh my gosh, that really took me back to yeah, yeah. that time too. Oh, because yeah. we forget that we sat down and wrote letters. Like with pencils. Yeah. Absolutely. And I also want to just say, as and I didn't, don't mean to be psychological here, but I almost minored in psych, so that's a big deal. What a weird flex. <laughs> um, from a young age, she took matters into her own hands. Mm. Did you notice that? So not everyone would do that alone, and she did that. I just Interesting to foreshadow what happens in the future is a young girl taking matter. She's upset by something, and she makes the move. Yeah. As a chess player, that's a strategic thing she had from early on. Right. Well, she learned to advocate for herself. And that's I huge. I truly think that she also learn to advocate for her mother oh, as well, I, that they were advocating for each other. Yeah, I think, and you talk about this, colorism, hierarchy, melanin, all came into play mm -hmm. with the mother and the daughter. Yeah. Because I thought, I agree with you, that was a fascinating dynamic. You know, I, it's, I can't imagine what it must have been like for a dark-skinned black woman. Right. Like, because I, I can... Like, that's me. Yeah, I'm a, a dark-skinned black woman about that age that her mother was when she's raising this child 30 years ago. Yeah. Like, the world has changed so much. Not, it has clearly isn't perfect because right. that's why we're sitting here having this conversation Amen. right now. Mm -hmm. But for her to be in that dynamic trying to get by with this child and the racism and the idea that she never, this was interesting when Megan had the conversation about um, they were leaving the Hollywood Bowl and her mother honked the horn and the person in front of her called her mother the N word. And she said that my mother never addressed it. We never had the conversation. We never had the race And talk. she also talked about the idea that she was never treated as a quote black woman until she got to the UK because she's white passing was essentially the, the subtext of that. Absolutely, I think that was so fascinating that she herself didn't self-identify in that way. And that also, how many people of color that I know of have had the race talk? Mm -hmm. That is like part of it, it's like the sex talk. Yeah. And her mom didn't feel because of her, like, like, she didn't sort of need it. It was never part of it. It wasn't part of her life. It wasn't an issue. Yeah. And how much it became an issue. Right. And how she had to become a spokesperson in a way, for all of that came much later in life. You know, I wonder, and I, I thought, that is so, it, a part of me was thinking, I remember having the race talk with my parents, like, probably at like five years old. Yeah, right. Like, I remember so early on them yeah. talking to my older brother about what to do if he gets pulled over by a police officer. Wow. I remember my parents saying things like when I when we moved out to the suburbs and it was a predominantly white area and a lot of my friends are white, there were only five black kids in my entire school. Oh my God. So I remember my mom saying things like, you need to be careful because you can't do what they do. Meaning right. you can't get away with the same things that your white friends are going to get away with. You are going to be scrutinized more. Like it was such a... It was such a common occurrence. Mm. So I thought, why would a black woman not, not tell her daughter that this is the way that the world works? And I came to the conclusion, and this, this is just speculation, I can't put myself physically in her shoes, but I would imagine that with all of the obstacles in terms of, you know, now their home is split, she's, you know, moving to the neighborhood to get support from her family. Megan doesn't really fit in, and she talks about this. She wasn't black enough. She wasn't, wasn't white, white enough. enough. Right. Um, she's already like in a boat by herself. 
was that her way of trying to protect her daughter, who clearly was not seen as black, by not putting that onto her early on, or and then in turn, ever? I always, I thought the exact same thing. You know when a kid doesn't want to be seen and they go like this, because if they can't and see, then they face, don't, yeah. they think you can't see them. <clears throat> I think it was a complete protection, a defense mm. mechanism, a coping skill. Um, I can't put one more thing on this kid. You know what I mean? I can't do it. And I don't know if that was a good move. I'm not a parent, <laughs> yeah. and I'm not a person of color, so I can't say that. But I wonder if she wishes she had. She did say that. Yeah. She like, said. I wonder how much, if, like, I wonder how much, I know she said it, it was like, how much guilt or, 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 or just regret that she yeah. never had that. It turned out to be such an important conversation. Yeah. You know what I mean? And Megan, in a lot of ways, was very much behind on that. A bit naive, yeah. I would say. And 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 fairly so, because she was never told. Right. But like she stepped into a world in which she was like, everyone's like, oh, she's not any like she didn't know. She just wasn't, it wasn't that wasn't her life. It wasn't her lived experience. Yeah. And I know a lot of people, and I've been asked, you know. I think that people felt a certain type of way about her saying that she wasn't treated as a black woman until she got to the UK. Mm. And I am never upset. Like I am very black presenting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like no one's You're confused. Black. Yeah. <laughs> no one is confused about, you know, who, who I am or what I am. Um, but when you talk about someone who for all practical purposes, Megan is racially ambiguous. Absolutely. Like when you start to get into the casting part of it, you understand even more why she wouldn't have identified or understood that. Mm -hmm. And I do not begrudge her for not having that understanding. I think that we have done in this country and in other countries a tremendous disservice to our future generations by not having the conversation of race and the conversation of what it means in the next couple of decades when the majority of the population will be of mixed race. Yeah, exactly. We are ill prepared for all of that mm -hmm. because we it has been met with such resistance from everyone from white supremacists who wish to keep you know, the white as, you know, Aryan or whatever mm. as the master race or dominant race. But it's also met with so much resistance from internally in black and brown groups. Which is why I don't think her mom wanted her to have to deal or delve into any of that. Mm. Because think about it, that's just so much more complicated. It's, and she's already dealing with divorce and she's already dealing with the move. And I just, I felt like she wanted to keep her safe and happy yeah and, and well, as soon as you said that you're like and now you can see why because it's right. so complicated or give Megan a different reality than what she was facing Absolutely. I also want to acknowledge too because we see this and you're of you're a Jewish woman I am um and we hear this idea of people want to conserve and make sure that you know, Jewish people are marrying Jewish people and black people are marrying black people and Mexican people go on and on are, are marrying within their race because they want to keep that tradition. They want to keep the, the blood pure from each, like each race or culture. And I respect that as well. I believe that that is a conversation that earns a sense of duality mm -hmm. between the conversation of people. Because when you're talking about numbers games alone, mm -hmm. it is inevitable that what is happening to our demographic in the world is going to happen because of a numbers game alone. Like, like just look at the stats. It will be, a, you. that's why we're going to have so many mixed race people. So I think Megan in this moment and her story does represent people in that facet as well. Yeah, I was just, I, I will be honest, I was shocked that of her naivete of no fault of her own. But of, of the fact that she didn't identify that, I was, I was amazed that she had skirted that mm -hmm. whole issue. And I think that that, I want, I, yeah, I just wonder if she wishes she had been taught yeah. that earlier. Well, and then also, what a weird juxtaposition for her. Had she been, you know, walked into casting saying, I'm a black woman. Oh, it's totally different. When, when she gets to the part where, you know, she's getting this acting career and she's getting breaks. Yeah. I thought the Suits conversation and that entire part about her um, job on Suits, because 
first of all, this is something it made me think of you because she's like, all I wanted was a network show with longevity. And when we first auditioned for the show that we're on, that's in season six right now, Daily Blast Live, I remember having that conversation with I, you. That's exactly right. That's all we wanted. I just wanted it to be stable. Yeah. We just wanted the stability of it. I also can't get over, there's one part in the montage of her at Suits, and they were always like, she was so up, she was so, you know, bubbly, and there's one part where they're doing like a reel, mm -hmm. and she's doing like a dance move with the three of them, and she just looks like... I don't know, from what you hear from what I've heard of, like, the diva, she seems so undiva. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? She seems like one of us on the set of, like, DBL. Yeah. She just seems, like, funny. She seems cool. She seems with it, down to earth. Um, and and I didn't know what to expect from her thing on Suits. Was she, I just, she just seemed really cool. Well, because she had a chance to live in her most authentic self. Yeah. The writers actually wrote to her experience being a biracial woman. I thought that was rad. That was the first time that she had been seen in that way and able to emote and act and be at work authentically. I was going to say, and honestly express that. Exactly. Which is, I mean, anytime you get to live in your authenticity, it is the most freeing. It makes you the ha happiest. And I thought... Wow, like it's great to see her like that before all of the drama. Yeah, right. Because, because it was a juxtaposition, yeah, right? And she it went was, away. And when she was dancing, I thought, how carefree. And I thought, oh, just a few, few like a few months. Yeah. It's all, it's like getting close to the waterfall. You know what I mean? And it all, it did change. It yeah. changed vastly. Yeah. You're listening to Comeback with Erica Cobb. I am here with Tori Shulman, my co host from Daily Blast Live, to talk about Harry and Meghan on Netflix episode two. Um, so we get into from the the cute. Well, I think we we skipped ahead, so we're uh, on the suits and all of that. But um, they we we do a breakdown of the media and the population of the UK. We learn that 3.5 percent of the population of the UK is black, and of journalists in the UK, 0.2 percent are black. That was bad. Um, which really shows you how the narrative is shaped and through whose lens is it is shaped by. Um, it sa uh, Harry said, we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was important because that is always the, um, the thing that we say when we call for representation because we need more people to see the world as they are in different lenses. I was gonna say, you need people, it's, it, uh, what's that Hamilton show, um, Hamilton song, um, the room where it happens. You have to have people in the room. Mm. If you don't have people in the room, if you have point zero 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 blah, 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 you're never gonna understand, and it be expected to understand in yeah. some ways. Like, how could you understand? And so the idea, and I, I also, to be honest with you, thought London was much more organically sort of cosmopolitan mm. in that way. And we learned a lot about that, I thought, too. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, we start to hear all of the racist tropes about everything from the neighborhood Megan came from. Compton. Straight out of Compton. Dude. Saying that, um, you know, Skid Row. And I was happy that she said, why you got to dig on Compton? Totally. <laughs> like, like why what are you? Up? Like, I'm not from there. Right. Like, but she was like, also, D why are you? Digging, you know? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like, I was like, yeah, girl, come. Yes. Like, why do that? <laughs> like, and it was always. Say something. Yeah, that was funny. I also thought that um, it was interesting to see them accept the NAACP President's Award and acknowledge George Floyd in their speech. Um, I thought that was so tremendously important. Um, that, to me, was like, oh, Harry and Meghan are all in yeah. on this. I think it's important to hear from what people say and what people don't say. And you didn't hear a lot from certain people people, I will say, in the American political world, um, the only person to say, like, on the floor and, like, a Republican senator is Mitt Romney to say Black Lives Matter. The disrespect is an answer. The disrespect mm. is a sentence. And so for him to have said it when maybe other people of the royal family wanted to avoid it yeah. says something. Yeah. It's a statement in itself that they did that. And it's important because it's a mark in terms, for me, of pop culture, societal culture, the ethos of where they want to go with mm -hmm. it. Um, George, that was a big moment. That was a really big moment. 
I also thought community. that it was a, a, a big moment, but it was a, a small moment that people probably didn't notice. But actor Anthony Anderson, <laughs> before they went out on stage at the NAACP Awards, gave Harry this like brother dap, yeah, like, the, like bring it in, man. Yeah, and know, Harry was like that. on cue, which he, I was like, like oh, Harry's been practicing yeah. because there is no way <laughs> that someone who wasn't allowed to be touched Ever for touched. most of his life is just going with the flow. I was like, I laughed so hard. I watched that <laughs> twice. I was like, okay, Harry, we and see like, you. From someone who wore a swastika as like a joke okay. on Hall, you know what I'm saying? Yes. To that, yes. is it is someone who had a comeback. You are, you're jumping ahead because that's going to be the next episode. And I oh, do want to understand like your feelings about that yeah, more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but well, I want to put like it that into, dad. That yeah. That was great. I want to put it into context of, um, of, of, the bigger, the greater episode. Um, because we learn in this episode also that Megan did not get a lot of help from None. the royal family in terms of what protocol was. Um, she talked about the idea of curtsying to the Okay, queen. the curtsy. We gotta talk about this, the curtsy. It's gone yeah. everywhere. And on my feed, I gotta be honest, everybody's saying that his body language, when she did this, let's all be clear, and a lot of people said he looked over and was like a little uncomfortable. Yeah, I, I, I don't, saw that. I don't disagree with yeah. that. I don't disagree with that. And I have to say, it was like a cultural thing that he's like, this is very normal for me and it's not normal for her. Yeah. I also have to push back on one thing. If you are a international relations double major from Northwestern, it is hard for me to believe you didn't know that you had to curtsy in front of the queen. Now, she probably thought it was more casual, but... I can understand people being confused by that, at yeah. least bringing that up. Does that make sense? No, I, I do. I and understand I exactly. That, no, like, no, no, no. But you want to. But you want to give. You want to give true feelings about it. Yeah. And like, because that I, felt weird to me. I agree. I, I agree. I do think that it would have been, it, a sim, like, and I, I maybe not a hundred percent, but like, your husband who isn't Jewish, no, saying that something that is a part of your Jewish culture read silly. Well, he did think matzo ball soup was just mozzarella, like a ball of mozzarella Chalo in hot Chalo. water, which is funny. But yeah, yeah, you're right. Chalo. It's like cultural. Um, but that was the only part I felt is she's so educated and so knowledgeable and so cultural. I would have thought she would have known you at least do a small curtsy. But I, I think- But maybe she didn't. Honestly, I don't know if that would have dawned on me. It would have. It, no, I don't think it would have because the Queen I of think England. I, I really don't think it would have. And maybe that, you know, maybe that says something about me. Um, but I thought when she <laughs> explained it, because I'd be That's like, be like I'd be like, OK, are you going to curtsy <laughs> to Big Mama? Because I expect you to curtsy to Big Mama. We're going tip for tat. OK, <laughs> right. Show her the respect she deserves as That's well. Right. That's right. Um, That's no, I think that um, the way that she explained it, and it wasn't even necessarily explaining it, you know, on its surface, was that she didn't understand that the formalities from the outside were the also on the were on the inside. Which is true. But I right. thought, I don't know, that was the one part I could understand people sort of, and Harry did look uncomfortable. And yeah. it's like when Brooks or, so, or someone wouldn't know something particular about my culture yeah. and sort of was sort of being funny about it. Um, but that was the only time where I was like, ooh, I don't 100% believe she didn't know. But I also get the point where she didn't understand how formal it all was. Right. Even Harry said that. He goes, who's tell as an American you have to bow to my grandma? Yeah. Like, that's a weird thing to do. Yeah. But I, I do agree with that. And also, you know, well, we never said the girl was perfect. I was going to say. Like, I mean, and I'm in a little motive too. Let's yeah, be honest. I'm pretty fact, dramatic. I'm, I'm looking for a little less perfection <laughs> because I think that's how you make, you know, a whole person. 100%. Um, there was a part when um, they were showing her in March of 2015, and she's and it was the UN Women's Advocate for Political Participation and Leadership. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that that was a moment where it was like, wow, she is really being prepared unknowingly again <laughs> for this role. Again, yeah, um, she fits the role. Yeah, she, it was like it was made for her. And that's what Harry said. Um, my heart told me she is the person I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. And then my head said. Well, she's absolutely perfect for the role. Yeah. 
Um, you mentioned that last episode. Yeah, I jumped ahead. I'm so sorry. No, no, no. I thought it was great that we saw the simple engagement, the matching onesie engagement party was hilarious. So cute. The penguins, because penguins made, made for life. <laughs> it was so, and then, you know, they're so corny. Yeah, I You know, love the it. dog with the candles and the whole picture. And yeah. It's just cute and relatable. Everyone says, oh, did they mention the roast chicken? Yeah, they had to do a bunch of interviews. And yeah, they yeah. had chicken and they mentioned it a lot. But to be honest, it's a really relatable engagement story. It's yeah. not over the top in any way. I got chills because as we neared the end of this episode, um, when I saw them sitting and she was wearing that green dress, mm. I remember that interview in that day like Who it doesn't? was yesterday. Of course. Of course. And it gave me chills to watch it from the other side of the equation. Okay, you're gonna not maybe understand this and maybe it's kind of a whirlwind, but I'll say very quickly, I'm watching this documentary about this guy, Peter Madsen, who ended up killing a woman, but someone was making a documentary at the same time. Mm. And so there's footage from there. And it's weird to see footage when you know so much on the other side. Mm. And you see you check everything. Every check is done. And I thought, wow, how much subtext is in every... She said she had to... The ring had to move. Everything yeah. was rehearsed. Yeah. And I kind of... I did. You just see her being tight a little bit. Yeah. I, I thought that there was joy... Because through all of that... They looked happy. They did look happy. They did, and like real happy. Yeah. Not like, you know what I mean? Exactly. Um, and I thought, watching them walk away, and she said, um, but truth be told, no matter how hard I tried, no matter how good I was, no matter what I did, they were still going to find a way to destroy me. And I just kept having flashbacks to the NBC tactical security team in Toronto, mm. having to have a tactical driver yeah. get her Invasive through driver. yeah, yep. um, paparazzi mm -hmm. and the hunt being on when they were so far away, she had to do that by herself. Oh yeah, I mean her life for real, even behind, there's a picture of her behind the gates of suits when yeah. things have changed and she was all happy, again, that one shot of her yeah. doing that dance, TikTok dance, and then she's like this and she's covered and they had to get her in and out and in and out and it's um, another adaptation that she went with Right. But, but was um, dramatically different. And again, I can't emphasize that Diana, which is, again, the goddess of the hunt. It mm. is so eerie to think how hunted they were and how how real and high stakes it was for Harry. Mm. It's not like it could happen. It did. Yeah. It did. You know, I think um, one of the most shocking things to me, or not shocking, but I felt like when she relocated to be with Harry. Yeah. She likely thought, well, now I don't have to do this alone. Right. So we are together. There's we can get through anything. Right. And then realizing that they're going to have to get through much more than ever anticipated in order to eventually get out. Yeah. And so seeing them walk away with when she was wearing the white, white coat yeah, right, right. Um, was so important to the next part of the story. So we are gonna get into episode three. This has been Harry and Meghan on Netflix. The recap on Come Back with Erica Cobb with my girl Tori Shulman. Hi there. Yes, we are gonna get into episode three next. So. Give us a review. Let us know what you think. Follow us on Twitter. Where can they follow you? At I am Tori Shulman. And that's Twitter and Instagram? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. And I, I am at Erica Cobb on all social media platforms. Um, stay tuned for episode three because we are going to get into the nitty gritty of the British slave trade. Hello. And the monarchy.